Hello and welcome to the Trauma Resonance Resilience podcast and my name's Lisa Cherry, I'm your host and it's very exciting because it's always very exciting to be with you today and this is something a little bit different than what I've done before. We've had um, last time on the podcast, and I strongly urge you to go and listen if you haven't, I had Suzanne Ziedike, and we were looking at adverse childhood experiences and getting a bit kind of deep and meaningful and nuanced and thoughtful about some of the quite polarized debate that often emerges particularly on social media around ACEs. Well, that conversation was so fab that we decided, well, I decided and then brought Suzanne along on the journey that we should have a part two. So welcome, Suzanne Seedike. It is delightful to be back with you, Lisa. Our last conversation had me thinking about all sorts of things and lots of people have made contact on social media and other ways to say it got them thinking. So I'm really delighted that we can extend that conversation. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, And this is a live webinar as part one was that I was recording. So we are joined live with lots of lovely people who are all saying hello in the chat box. Um, And that means that the format of this session um, will be that we speak for about 40 minutes and then we go to Q&A and and, uh, the whole uh, session will take about an hour. Now, when we started last time, Suzanne, I started by saying, I want to talk about power. And actually what happened was we didn't spend a lot of time talking about power at all. We skirted around power and that's interesting to me so I kind of want to set the tone again and start part two by going I'd really like to start with talking about power but actually let's let's go there let's go there and I have no idea where this conversation is going to go because that's not the way that I do things I'm not that interviewer that's got a set of questions I'm just working with you working with what comes up feeling the energy and kind of going with that space so Suzanne, should we talk about power? Lisa, I would love to talk about power and the ACEs debate because I do think that that's a really important theme in it. I think it often doesn't get talked about and therefore I think to be able to name it and explore it will be helpful for people. And I think about it a lot now. So for me, it'll just be delightful to be able to talk about it. Okay, so let's let's talk about what we both see as power because I guess we're both going to have different lenses at how we look at that we both have different life experiences or as um, uh, a lecture I was watching the other day with a, a human geographer said we have different maps and I really liked that isn't that lovely we're made up of a different map because of the different experiences that we've had that, that that create our lens and our view that we've given meaning to so let let's start with that really so when you think about power what are you thinking about what's coming to your mind especially in relation to the aces debate which has helped me to think about power it highlights some basic questions about power for me who decides what is important in human experience? Who gets to name it? Who gets to explain the meaning of it? Whose story gets told? Whose explanation gets told? And so the fancy, the fancy word for that is epistemological. Who decides what knowledge is? And who decides, you know, who decides that? Who gets to proclaim it? So really what counts as power and how you make sense of human experience and indeed how you make sense of the world is an epistemological question. Now you don't have to use that big word, but I'm just putting it out there so that people will know that it has been thought of as a thing that can be studied. Okay, so when it comes to ACEs, I think we are having a debate about how we understand human experience, who gets a voice on that, What if there is tension about who gets a voice? So one of the debates in the ACEs movement, I think, is is it lived experience 
that gets a voice about what trauma is? Or is it the more traditional power brokers like professionals and researchers? And so I have come to the conclusion that there is something of some tension going on around this. It's really, uh, there are some shifting of, of power uh, places or roles in that. And I think that that is part of what is creating some of the tension. And I don't really hear that being talked about in as many places as I would, as I would like. So I even, you see me swallow there slightly as I talk about it. People with lived experience of trauma. So Liz Perry is here tonight from Canada. Uh, I can see that in the chat box. And Liz Perry says, Liz, Elizabeth Perry says all the time that for her, ACEs is about lived experience. And she speaks from the perspective of lived experience. And so for her, that's a fundamental uh, place from which she is speaking about this issue. It isn't for everybody. Um, so if you're researching it, that's a different perspective to start from than if you're speaking from lived experience. And that I think helps us to start to think about what is some of the tension that's going on. And, and that's even more complicated by the fact that there are also people with lived experience who do not find um, thinking about ACEs empowering. Entirely, absolutely. So some people will he clearly hear ACEs as a, a deficit frame. Yeah. In other words, they see the problems and they see the risks and shining a light on those is not something that they find helpful. And other people who have a trauma background, what might be called ACEs, find it really helpful. So, you know, so Michelle Brennan Jones is here tonight and she has put out a talk herself about how ACEs helped her to really understand what was going on with her life and helped to turn that around. So I think it's really fascinating and exciting. How do we make sense of both of that? If a tone develops in the debate that says one of those groups is wrong, then it starts to become divisive. So before we started recording, you and I were saying how important we thought curiosity was, getting curious about how people who see this differently than you still see it, I think is crucial to finding our way through some of the tension. And it kind of brings us straight back to where we were in part one really, which is, why can we not have both okay? You know, what is it about ACEs that actually means that we can't have both okay? Whereas with other frames and other theories, we might be okay with that. There's something very particular. I, I mean, I don't know the answer to this, you know, uh, and, 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 I, and I'm guessing that we don't, you know, if we're just kind of feeling our way through it, although the look on your face says you have an idea. So really? we're gonna go there. <laughs> but you know, there's something about it that makes that makes both of holding both of those voices and i would argue there's more than two it's not a polarized debate at all it's a spectrum um really difficult what what why do you think that is i mean are you still going to hang that on the uh, are you going to still hang that on power well let me complicate it a bit right in fact, let me go back the way. We have for at least 200 years and more as a, you know, as cultures tried to understand the nature of human, of mental health, let's just say that. So in 1840, because I looked it up today, the first diagnostic and statistical manual was pulled together, which was an attempt by psychiatrists or the people who would become psychiatrists um, to understand mental illness. Hmm. And what the people who designed that came up with was we think these are disorders. We think we can see these as abnormal and we can create names for them and categories for them. And so we'll create kind of a manual that will help, will help people to know that. So that the way of understanding mental health became a disorder. So you had disordered behavior and feelings and, and mental health, and then you had normal mental health. Okay, 
And then we got to World War I and there was a lot of attention to trauma and that actually trauma produced behavior like shell shock. And we began to think about the nature of human experience and behavior in a new way. Okay, fast forward to now. ACEs and trauma, so extend from the World War I, says, you know what, I'm not sure that disordered stuff makes sense. Actually, what happens, what, what if some of the behavior and experiences that we have seen as disordered are actually the normal outcome of trauma? So now we have some really different ways of conceiving human experience and human behavior and human suffering. Okay, ACEs is, is in that discussion, <clears throat> but the way that it got conceptualized and measured from the outset is I think part of what I'm just gonna call the tension because I think that really matters to some people. So because Feliti and Anda, in order to put it into empirical research, measured it through a scale of zero to 10, it was conceptualized because it needed to be measured in a numerical fashion. And in fact, I saw a paper recently that was entitled Trauma by Numbers. Some people find that basic conceptualization anathema, I think. Just for them, it is just the wrong way to think about trauma. And for them, it's so fundamental they anything that comes after that is kind of, it, it doesn't matter. It's, I don't know if irrelevant is the right word, but the conceptualization for them is just wrong. Okay, then there are other people that I call now think of as trauma by idea. They're not concerned about that conceptualization and the way it got measured. What is exciting for them, if exciting is the right word, is the idea that childhood trauma can produce lasting consequences for the body. And they're not, they're not so worried about how it got measured. What for them is the excitement is the idea. And so I think part of the tension it are some, is some very, um, some strong views at the level of how important is the conceptualization. And what we do with that, I don't know, but I think if that is the source of some of the tension, I think it's really helpful to, to understand that that's where it's coming from. Hmm. And there is, there is, you. Yeah, I mean, there is also suspicion about it coming out of health, about it coming out of private health care, because of course uh, we, we know about the Institute and we know about, you know, the kind of, um, America has a very different health model to us, you know, so it's, it, it's a, private enterprise so of course there is money involved in the production of those statistics and the people there are there because they have health care and you know these are very I, I can understand the tensions about how ACEs was con conceptualized and I think it's helpful that you know that you have pondered it enough to put that out there um, to think about where that might come from i mean i guess it doesn't it doesn't help us in any way kind of people then get if they get stuck in that place then you know what do we do then you know yeah, that's why i keep coming back to curiosity anybody who follows my work know that i go on and on and on about curiosity so if you get stuck that's a great word if you we get stuck and we can't get curious about what is happening for people who have a different view than me, then we end up in this divisive place. Mm. I don't think that help. That doesn't help. That doesn't help children who are suffering. For me, this ultimately comes down to childhood suffering. How do we make sense of childhood suffering, of human suffering, and of its consequences? And so that's why I went all the way back 200 years ago. 200 years ago, they were trying to make sense of mental health. They might not have called it suffering because they didn't conceive of it that way and they didn't know some of the things we know now, but they were asking the same questions we are doing now. 
How do you make sense of human behavior and human experience? And of course, I'm saying 200 years ago, it goes much, much further than that. And other cultures have done the same. If we understand that ACEs is about this fundamental question that has been going on for, you know, I don't know, forever in the human experience, it doesn't, it decreases the, let me try that again. It puts what we are asking now in a wider context. And I think that's insightful. How do we make sense of human suffering? How do we make sense of childhood suffering? How do we do that? ACEs is an attempt to answer that same question. What I'm intrigued with is that we are still needing to come up with new ways to do that. Mm. And, and that in some ways we are reworking some long standing questions. But you suggested just a moment ago that you felt that it's, we're possibly in a paradigm shift. Um, and I, I think that's possible too, especially when you think about um, the power threat meaning framework and the kind of reactions that Lucy Johnston gets um, whenever she writes about power threat meaning um, or she's, you know, drop the disorder, that that whole area um, equally gets far more, far more um, problematic uh, discourse than ACEs, I think. And, and that is a direct uh, reaction to the DSM uh, and basically, you know, saying that we we should oh look at your face you see people listening on the podcast can't see Suzanne's face but she's going okay let, now let's go back to power yes this is where we started okay who gets to decide to decide what the meaning of human experience is who has the power to decide it who is accorded the power or who claims the power, who fights their way to power. There are power structures in our culture as there will be in any culture who have the ability to, you know, who have the power to assign meaning to human experience. So go back to the DSM, professionals carry the power to do that. You can be given a disorder in America, you, there's a whole economic structure that goes with the, the assignment of a disorder. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you can build a professional, an economic, a cultural structure around particular interpretations of human experience and suffering. I mean, it's not surprising. In fact, it's almost inevitable but people don't get a chance to think about this stuff, right? You don't often get a chance to unpack it. Okay, what happens if you then start to have an argument about whether the frame that the people in power brought is the one that has to be, or what if there is an alternative? And so I do think ACEs is part of a po possible paradigm shift. I actually think that's been going on since 1940s and 50s with attachment theory, because for me, ACEs and attachment theory are very uh, overlapping. They're the same territory. Lots of people won't know that because we don't always use the word attachment with ACEs. But for me, ACEs is extending the insights from attachment theory. Who is not always using the word attachment with ACEs? I'm curious about that. When you say we don't always do that, who, who is not doing that? Medics. Um, so Okay. So if ACEs comes out of a medical background, which makes some people uncomfortable, Nadine Burke Harris is a pediatrician. Mm. Anda and Feliti are seen as medics. So, I mean, if I read everything that any of them have written, I might find the word attachment, but off the top of my head, I have never seen any of them talk about ACEs through an attachment framework. So the word buffering is more likely to get used now. For me, buffering is about what Bowlby would have called a secure base, a secure attachment. But this and is 
have very interesting discussions about the theoretical basis for buffering versus security, but we're not having those discussions because I don't think there's enough link made between the attachment and the ACEs. Right. This is really interesting. And I want to hold this, this point because this might actually be a, a, a clue into some of the tension that comes out of academia, out of social work, is that we have this, um, this study, the ACEs study, that is clearly about trauma and clearly about adversity and clearly about attachment relationships and early childhood development and all childhood development. And yet those are not the things discussed from the outset. Correct. Yeah. So that hadn't really, that penny hadn't really dropped before this moment because, because that's so um, clear for me to see because of my map, the map of me, the work I've done, the settings I've worked in, the frameworks that I'm used to working with, the academic stuff that I will have read and the practice that I will have uh, delivered. It hadn't occurred to me that, that those connections wouldn't have been made at the outset. So I think that's really interesting. Okay. And I think that gives us a clue about some of the tensions. Okay, let me build on that. ACEs is really an empirical discovery. So a correlational design was used to discover what for some people was not a discovery at all. So some people have gone, all of us know that. How come Felipe and Andy are so late to the party to know that about child sexual abuse? And it's true, feminist social workers in the 1970s knew that there was a relationship. And you could say, how come Felidi and Anda didn't know that? Well, so did Freud. So did Freud. I mean, it's, you know. Well, the, the bottom line is they didn't. So sometimes now people go, but we know that. It's probably true there are we's that know about the impact of childhood trauma, but there are many other we's who do not. So when we think that everybody knows what our sector knows, we forget to be curious about what other people don't know. And ACEs has been effective for all its limitations in helping a lot more people to get interested in the impact of trauma who had no idea that that was part of their employees. Most business owners have no idea of this and they don't know that they could help and they don't even know that it's their responsibility. That's interesting that ACEs can reach, you know, groups of people who have never thought about this before. But go back. Okay, so ACEs is an empirical discovery. It doesn't have any theory. So after the original discovery in 1998, what has needed to happen is that, we'll just call them the medics, needed some theory about how that you know, neurodevelopmental problems occurred in the ACEs triangle. Well, attachment theory can supply some of that theory about how that happens. But because ACEs didn't start from a relational frame at the time that it was discovered, we've got these two things that I think are the same territory, but that are starting from different places that are using different language that are using different assessment techniques. So attachment used the strange situation paradigm. That's a behavioral assessment paradigm. And everybody didn't get upset about that because it was about children. One of the reasons, one of the other reasons that I think ACEs exercises people is that it's about all of us, or it's the potential to be about all of us. And that, and, you know, not surprisingly, people have feelings about that. So if we come from an attachment paradigm, people think that's about children. So that becomes the, the people over there, the children. It's not about us adults. ACEs starts from adults and works backwards. Attachment started from children and works forward. ACEs shows the long-term consequences, but didn't provide any theory. Attachment shows the start 
and the theory, but didn't have very good data for projecting into the future. And this takes us to the next problem. This okay. takes us to the next problem, which is that because it starts with the adult and work backwards and attachment starts with the child and works upwards, we're still left with this gaping hole of injustice, of social injustice, community injustice, system trauma, community trauma. And that's another aspect of the theory, if you like, that, that then doesn't get added to the debate and the discussion in a meaningful way. And in fact, that has been one of the tensions as well, hasn't it? You know, where is that? This is individualized and, you know, it doesn't, it, there's no activism and there's no, I mean, that's not how I see it. I have to say, I think it opens up a really big opportunity for um, activism, um, but that's through my lens. That's through the we that I sit with and we've already discussed and talked about the fact that there are a whole other bunch of we's uh, that will probably be very comfortable in individualizing it and believing that the problem therefore lies in the individual and is not a mishmash of the community and the socioeconomic circumstances that we're living in. Where, okay, so switch it slightly. Where do you start with the solution? So let's switch to poverty for a moment. Okay, so one of the areas of tension is, is ACEs, is a focus on ACEs keeping us from solving poverty? So there are some people who feel really strongly that we need to focus much more on poverty and ACEs doesn't do that enough because it feels too individualized. It's it, the, the trauma is occurring within the family. Some people feel really strongly about that. In fact, I had someone who wrote to me this week and said, I really think that ACEs and poverty, you can't talk about ACEs without talking about poverty. I have to say, I disagree. Poverty absolutely causes all sorts of trauma and injustice, and we, we need to fight it, and we need find, to find ways to eliminate it. But it is not the only place in which children suffer. And so I think if we make ACEs, equivalent to poverty, it blocks us from seeing the diverse ways in which children can suffer. And it also makes it possible that what we'll do is we'll focus on those communities over there. And I now don't have to think how suffering relates to me because it's only the deprived communities over there. And I think it is more powerful if we understand that this is about all of us as human beings, even if that is uncomfortable to think about. And so if, if I thought that an ACEs model using that language, if, that, that, that if we just got rid of that, that Boris Johnson would now feed hungry children I would feel delighted, but I don't think that bringing an awareness of, I don't think that solving poverty is only about bringing that, about where we put together an ACEs model in poverty. I don't think that solving poverty is, solving is the wrong word there. You shouldn't need science to know that hungry children shouldn't go hungry. And so it be- Amen, sister. <laughs> so, so in other words, what I'm saying is that, here's what I'm really trying to say, is you can hear me um, stuttering through my sentence. I think it is really hard for us to see childhood suffering. I think we're very good at denying it. I think we're very good at shutting it off. And I think that questions about why that is so hard for us to do that are deeper even than the science of childhood suffering. Mm -hmm. And so we're going back to questions about psychoanalysis and Freud and the power of denial. And I think we need to talk about these really difficult issues and they are difficult, which you can hear in my own searching for the words and trying to make a sentence with it. 
Absolutely. And um, and again, I guess that's what adds to the whole challenging debate when it's tried to be played out on Twitter. You know, this is this is deep stuff. This is complicated stuff. This is why I wanted to have an opportunity, you know, to have deeper conversations about it that takes it away from 140 characters or even 280, however many we've got, when we're trying to grapple with some really quite difficult things and aspects. Um, so I'm with you on that one. And I one of the reasons this really matters for me is that when the debate gets angry, people get scared. And when people get scared, they then shut down and they back off and they don't know if they're entitled to have a view, if they don't feel confident enough, um, they're afraid they might get it wrong. And children go on suffering. So I think the questions about how we conceptualize human experience, how we measure it for empirical research, how we talk about it, how the science is applied by politicians and policymakers and people in formal roles of power, all of those are really important questions. And ACES is not, ACES has its limitations. It's, you know, it doesn't solve all the problems, but ultimately we're talking about childhood suffering. And uh, we adults have a responsibility to think deeply and to stay curious about the ways to do that. Because if we can't, children can tend to suffer and then that spirals into adulthood and it spirals into inner, to down the generations. I haven't been able to keep up with the comments in the box. Uh, do put your comment, do put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll be going to Q&A in about eight minutes, but I just wanted to mention Lee's comment there that's come up. Um, I feel like if we use that language and solving poverty compounds the barriers of them and us and still brings up that power imbalance, ACEs is a human dilemma, not another thing that those of us living in poverty need someone putting their head to the side for and saying, you've had it hard. Pity does not empower those living in poverty. And I think there's, there's something about that. I'm really curious about the word pity um, because it's something that I find incredibly difficult. Um, and I've, I said this the other week, I actually find it really difficult to talk about, um, but I'm going to put it out there uh, because, and I might have said it on part one, I don't remember, but whenever I get into personal experience uh, on a public platform like Twitter, there are invariably people who go straight into the pity place. And it's really interesting, and I'm fascinated um, by, by that, why that is an immediate place to go to. And the only thing I can come up with is that there's a kind of othering going on. You know, that pity is essentially like Lee has just kind of raised there, a kind of othering. So where does othering sit in this whole discussion around some of the tensions to do with ACEs? I mean, that's a big question, right? So, but I'm, <laughs> I like to throw them out there, Suzanne, but there's something about othering, whether it's maybe, and I'm just thinking on my feet here, I don't know, but maybe there's something about saying, that isn't relevant to me, that's nothing to do with me. Um, so there's an othering going on there, or, and, and that's, I mean, look, blah, 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 blah. you see, that's what happens. That's what happens when we try and unpick this stuff. So glad because my sentences were a bit difficult a minute ago and I thought, okay, I'm getting lost in what I'm trying to think. I'm delighted to see you going blah, 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 blah as well. Blah, blah, blah. There's Sissy. Can I just say what Sissy said and then come back and tell me? I hear you, Lisa. It's like saying you're so brave. Oh, you're so brave. Only, it's only brave if we're being othered and others are judging or shaming us for things we've had zero responsibility for and aren't a reflection of us at all, she says. I reject the pity and I reject the you're so brave as it feels it comes from the same place. You're right. And it's, there's the pity, there's the you're so brave, there's the you're somehow special and different. You're somehow different to me. 
And that's the stuff that my body just goes, can't do that. Let me add to that. So let me flip it. That's where the judgment also comes in. So let me go back to hungry children. Okay, right. Because, and for anybody who is coming from outside the UK, there's a big debate going on about here in the UK about whether hungry children could be fed by funds from the government over uh, school holiday times when normally they would have had school, um, they would have had meals in school. And Lisa has been a big leader in that campaign on social media. So there's been a big argument going on here. Okay, what happened in the Victorian period is that a number of, I'm just gonna use really strong language here, middle-class do-gooders decided that maybe they should help some families living in poverty because they felt sorry for them but you had to show that you deserved the middle-class assistance. So if you were the deserving poor, you got help. And if you were the undeserving poor, then you weren't seen as needing help because you should stretch your budget. You didn't work hard enough. In other words, you had to live up to someone else's standards, but you got judged. That same dynamic has come up in, in last month's debate were families living in poverty working hard enough? Were they, um, were they wasting their money on iPhones and skyboxes? And therefore, that was a reason to not feed children in poverty because their parents were responsible for feeding them and they were the undeserving poor because they were bad parents. For me, that dynamic absolutely overlaps on the pity and the brave one, and it takes us back to power. It others people because I decide whether you are deserving of my respect and compassion. And we're suddenly all the way back to where we started, which is these power dynamics. And increasingly, I just think that if we could look at and confront some of those power dynamics more, we, we might better understand where some of the tension is coming from and we might be coming up with better responses and solutions to, to some of those tensions. Because if we can't do that, you know, in another hundred years, there'll be people like us here all over again. I would like us to find more creative ways to address and more effective ways to address childhood suffering. But in order to do that, we will also need different cultural values than we currently have in an awful lot of Western countries, including the UK and the USA. And so these are wider issues than just individuals and yeah. individual families. Yeah. Um, the two books, just for the listeners, that I guided people to um, on Twitter, one of them was Higginbotham, A History of Children's Homes. Really fascinating book that looks at the creation of charities, the ones we still have today, where they came from, what, where they were derived from, you know, I, I think it's just fantastic. And the other book was um, Al Ainsley Green, which yeah. is, um, uh, oh, what's the book called? Help me, help me. Um, Lisa, I'm closing my eyes because I know exactly which you one you can picture the book. Uh, I'll pop it up in the notes, in the show notes. Um, but both really help um, understand the history uh, of UK's relationship um, with children and poverty. And I'm going to take us to the Q and A um, and have a look what we've got going on here. And we've got our first question in. How do we get the balance right to acknowledge that some of us have been through rubbish without brushing over it, but at the same time, without pitying? That's a really good question. Do you want to go there? Or do you want me to go there, Suzanne? Well, I think here's how I do that. I start by making sure that I don't pity. I start with me and I... 
I mean, I, I don't think I'm drawn to that. I'm happy to have anybody point out to me where I might have done that, but I make a point of not doing that. I make a point of talking about not doing that. And then I try to ripple that out. I have control over how I think and how I approach it. So one place to start is with ourselves and how we help our, the organizations and the groups that we're with to pay attention to that too. Now that is not gonna solve all of it, but it is a place to start and it is something that I have control over. And I use my voice to try to talk about that and confront it. Where do you start, Lisa? Empathy. Okay, go on. Well, I think empathy is just such a different place to pity, isn't it? You know, I mean, I think it's, it's much more comfortable for me to hear from someone that sounds really shit, you know? Rather than, oh, that's so brave. <laughs> There's a real difference there, isn't there? You know, oh, that's so brave. Or actually, that sounds really shit. That sounds really, really difficult, you know? And just being with that. And I, and I think that's one of the reasons that Brene's work around empathy and vulnerability has just been so powerful for people because it's given this entire narrative, um, uh, entire language by which to express some of that. So I think, Colette, what I would say is that when we express empathy or receive empathy, I think the whole energy is different. And the way of working with empathy, I think, comes from the comes from starting with the empathy you have for yourself. And and Lisa, if we then apply that to our children, right? It's really hard when you can't take away your children's pain. It's hard when you can't take away other people's pain as well. But it's especially hard when you can't take away your children's pain. So we're very likely to say things like, oh, honey, it'll be better. Um, you don't need to worry about that at all. Let's cheer up because we're trying to take away our children's tough feelings. If we can mm -hmm. sit with them with their tough feelings, then they're not alone with them. Because when you try to take away the feelings, even though it comes from a wish for other people like our children to not suffer, when you try to take away them you actually deny them so that's partly what i mean i work really hard at at making sure that i hear people's pain that i don't move into denial even when it's really hard for me to hear it, it it's it is taking care of myself if i try if I deny other people's feelings because it is hard for me to hear them. And that's a really hard place. That is hard to accept that we need to stand with other people in their suffering because sometimes that suffering is, but they're living it. I was thinking about uh, this week, I was thinking about relational poverty and why when I'm delivering training and I have to spend quite a lot of time unpicking the word relationship, what a relationship is. And I was thinking about this, why is this so difficult? But of course it's difficult because in order for you to understand relational poverty, if you come from a place of relational wealth, you literally have to imagine all the people who you really love have been removed from your life. Yep. If you are to understand relational poverty, you have to go within and annihilate all the people in your life that, that you love to bits so that you can understand relational poverty. Now, who wants to do that? Who seriously wants to go on that journey? That is deep, deep stuff and requires really careful facilitation and skilled facilitation. Do you know, Lisa, I think Michelle is here, Michelle Brennan Jones. I think she's here tonight. Uh, Michelle taught me something really, really valuable. She came to a workshop that I did early on in the rise of the ACEs movement. And people had come to that workshop choosing to fill out an ACEs questionnaire and also uh, what is often called a resilience questionnaire 
Okay, so the ACEs questionnaire, as many people will know, looks at what happened to you. The resilience questionnaire looks at what your buffering was, what your relationships were. And Michelle said at that event, and I wouldn't be saying this if I didn't think Michelle was happy for me to say it, is that filling out the ACEs questionnaire was, was not as nearly upsetting as was filling out the resilience questionnaire. Because what she discovered was the relationship she did not have. Yeah. And that she hadn't quite thought about that. And that's a really powerful story because lots of us will take those relationships for granted. Yeah. Michelle's story is an example of what you just said. Sometimes what you discover is what you, what you didn't have rather than the pain that did occur to you. And that flips on its head some of the ACEs insights and, and I think we just need to think about those complexities and that, and that depth more than simply the 10 events in the ACEs questionnaire. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Colette, for that. Um, Fiona, Fiona says, can you say a little bit more about denial? So the denial of ex effects of experiences and who does this serve? Who asked that question, Lisa? That's Fiona. Fiona. What a brilliant question. Here's my best illustration. Fiona is brilliant, that's why. How we do it. It's a brilliant question. <laughs> the question that is asked in the film Inside Out. I talk about that film a lot because at one level, it's a safe place for us to talk about these incredibly difficult, painful, scary issues because it's a Pixar film. And you kind of know it's going to end it happily because it's a Pixar film, but along the way they take you through a terrible journey. And for anyone who's not seen that film, um, it's about Riley who's 11 years old and her dad got a new job and they left the home she loved and they moved across America and she hates it. She misses home, she misses the tree, she misses how the tree smells, she misses her hockey team, she misses her back garden, she misses her friends. She does not like life in San Francisco but her parents cannot hear that because they want her to be happy because they dream this up and they want her to love it here and they want her to like her new school and they want her to like her new bedroom. And she keeps trying to tell them that she is unhappy and she misses home and she's homesick and they can't hear it. And so that film is all about how a little girl has to deal with big feelings all on her own and she closes down and she closes down and she closes down so that all she is left with to manage life's experiences is disgust and fear and anger. And the crucial moment in the film to give away the spoilers is when finally her parents can hear that she is unhappy and everything turns around when they can hear her feelings. But up till then, they've been trying to help her to be happy. And the point of that film is that the relationship goes deeply awry. That's denial. And it's because the parents found it too hard to think that they could have made the little girl that they love unhappy. If that's denial in your own relationships and the people who are most important in your life, it's very easy to deny the experiences of people that you don't think you know or whole groups of people that you don't know or that you don't know to be curious about. Denial keeps us feeling safe and able to manage our own lives. If I give one more example, in the 1950s, in hospitals, you weren't allowed to come and visit your children, except at visiting hours on say a Sunday. And when Robertson, who began to realize this wasn't good for children, tried to help the staff to see that they needed new visiting policies and for parents to stay, the staff couldn't hear him. The idea that they had been that their policies and practice had been damaging children when they had intended to help was too hard for them to hear. And so they had a gigantic fight about what the change should be for practice. The denial served them. So that's one other thing I would add to Fiona's question. Denial serves us, even though it doesn't serve other people a lot of the time. Mm. you add things to that, Lisa? 
I'm not going to add to that. I think you covered that beautifully. <laughs> I'm going to take us now to Sissy. Okay. Deep question. Okay, so how do we bridge the experience gaps so that those with relational wealth recognize that they have it and we spend time there and not just talk about at-risk people and those with relational poverty? I think we are all impacted by the presence or absence of either and that part gets missed too often. So it's not a welcoming and opening conversation, but an othering one, which I don't think it has to be. Lisa, you take that one. It's a really difficult one because by acknowledging relational wealth, my experience is sometimes what happens is people who have that feel shame mm. and that can shut down the conversation before you can go somewhere. I think conversations about that have to be held really skillfully and carefully. Um, but whenever I talk, I talk a lot about resilience. I use the word resilience, even though I know it's not, um, it's another very contentious word, but I'm clear about what it means for me and I make that explicit. And it means um, having resources, relational resources, food, uh, sleep, our basic needs, um, housing, safety, security, all of those things. Um, and I was talking about that somewhere or other, I can't remember, and talking about how, you know, we, we need to get comfortable with having a look at what our resources are and observing what we do have and observing what we don't have and learning some of those skills about how we ask others for help in building those resources. And I guess that's what a lot of self-help groups are, 12-step uh, programs. And then when we feel resourced and we have that discussion with ourselves, then we know that we're in a position to add to somebody else's um, system, resource system. Uh, so I do think that that's, a, that's uh, having deeper conversations about how we how we think about resources rather than when we've got someone in front of us talking about all the things that they, they don't have, a little bit of focus on what they do have and thinking about how we access things that we don't collectively. You see, the problem is, is that services are still working with the individual. This is yep. a challenge because until we have services that understand interdependence and how we build relationships that are not service dependent and policy dependent, but broaden what's available to people in the community, uh, then we're not going to be having the right conversations. And I think we've got Melissa in the room, and um, I know that that's a huge part of the work that she does at the Hub. Um, because the conversations about relationships, resources, resilience, relational wealth, relational and policy, uh, poverty come out of a particular lens about how we help each other that is not the lens of most services. And I think that partly it goes all the way back to disorders, which came up earlier today, right? When you see this as a disease, as a disorder, as a condition, then it's a thing that you have that we have to fix and that's a really different way of understanding human experience and suffering, a different conceptualization than, you know, so relational versus disorder. Those are really fundamentally different ways of understanding it and they bring up different solutions. Mm. And so if, for me, relationships are at the heart of this. So in Scotland, with my contributions to, to ACE's discussions, I have worked very hard to keep relationships at the center of those discussions. For people who think that is not the central issue and scoring and the, the numerical uh, conceptualization is the crucial issue, then they are hearing a, a really different element of this conversation. How do we, that would be another question. How do we bridge that from 
thinking that the crucial issue is relationships versus the crucial issue is the way it was measured. That's an important thing to bridge if we are to, you know, to create some ways to move forwards with this. I think that's one of the, the things that we will need to find ways across that bridge. I think that's a great place to um, end this discussion. <laughs> really? <laughs> Relationships right at the heart of uh, the conversation. Um, and how, how do we, the question I guess then that we can all go off and ponder is how do we help and support people who don't understand that relationships are at the heart of this, who interpret that numerical way of understanding ACEs? How do we help and support those people to think relationally and think about uh, systemic uh, resources, relationships, uh, relational wealth as a goal? So, there we are. Thank you so much, Suzanne. It's been wonderful to have you. I can see that you could talk all night about this stuff. Don't be asking me for a part three. <laughs> what, I, what I hope is that other that all the people who are here tonight feel empowered to ask those questions themselves and to have those conversations with others as well. It needs all the voices. Elizabeth said that from Canada. We need all the voices. And if we can keep relationships in there, then I am really excited because I think that's at the core of what we need as human beings. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Pleasure always to be with you, Lisa.